Good afternoon or morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you here at our webinar. Um, my name is Julia Kaufman. I'm a senior policy researcher at RAND, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming you for joining us today um, for our webinar. For the past several years, um, Elaine Wang and I and some of our partners at the University of Southern California have been conducting research to conceptualize measure and gather data on the extent to which US K-12 instructional systems are coherent. So what that means, how to measure it, and how to understand it. Um, this all has been generously supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Um, and our presenters um, are, are joining us today from uh, very different places. Um, I, so I'd like to welcome them too. So if you wanna go ahead to the next slide. Um, the main presenter today is my good colleague and co-lead for this research, Dr. Elaine Wang, policy researcher at RAND, specializing in research on K-12 instruction and instructional systems. Um, to help us situate our findings in a larger body of work and to provide insightful comments are our two panelists, who I was thrilled were accepted our invitation today. Um, I've used them in my research, but I've never really interact interacted with them in this kind of a setting. So I'm really excited to have them here. Um, Dr. Tom Hatch, Professor of Education at Teachers College, Columbia University, and Director of the National Center for Restructuring Education, Schools, and Teaching. And Dr. Emily Hodge, Associate Professor of Education in the Department of Educational Leadership at Montclair State University. Um, we're excited to have their perspectives and their expertise today. I want to also acknowledge all the other people have, who have contributed to this research. Um, my other co-leads for this project include um, Darlene Opfer from RAND and Morgan Polakoff from USC. And we have a number of researchers who have done a lot of other work. On this, on this project in various capacities. And so it's thanks to them and also our American educator panels that we're able to share all this data with you today. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Elaine. Um, thanks, Julia, and thanks um, to everybody for being here. As, as Julia has mentioned, RAND has been conducting multiple studies of instructional system coherence. And our goal are twofold. One is to support researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to understand coherence. And two is to provide guidance and tools um, to help improve it. So here are our recent products from our body of work on instructional system coherence. Our presentation today draws primarily from survey research on coherence in math and ELA, uh, English language arts instructional systems across the US. And we also bring in complementary qualitative insights and our case study of coherence in two states. Based on this work, we've developed a toolkit designed to support K-12 districts and schools to take stock of their system coherence. And we actually have a forthcoming webinar that will focus on the use of this toolkit later this summer. So I think some definitions are necessary here. Um, in our conceptualization, an instructional system is composed of components that send signals to teachers about what to teach and how to teach it. In this era of standards-based reform, academic standards present perhaps the clearest message about what content students are expected to master. But I think we all know there's a widespread recognition that standards in and of themselves will not lead to desired changes in teaching and learning. So other components of the school's instructional system must reinforce the standards, i.e. be aligned to them, and also support each other and provide similar guidance i.e. be coherent with each other for teachers to get clear messages on what and how to teach. And in this system, these components are thought to work in concert rather than in disconnected silos. And we believe this will improve instruction and propel student learning. And then on the other hand, incoherence among instructional system components or messaging can lead to con conflicting messages about what and how to teach and we believe these, this leads to fragmented instruction and learning. Um, in our research, we have focused on seven specific instructional system components. Uh, just very briefly, they are the state standards for ELA or math in our case, curriculum materials, formal school or district offer professional development 
And also what we're calling teacher collaboration guidance. You can think of this as the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and guidance around what to focus on or how to use peer collaboration time in a school. Teacher evaluation criteria and process. And then our final two components that we focus are on our interim or benchmark assessments and summative assessments. To be clear, what we focused on in our research, primarily through surveys, is teachers' perception of school level coherence and not some uh, quote unquote objective notion of coherence. And we also acknowledge that there are district and state level contexts to think about. And we bring in some of this in our qualitative explorations today, and we have reports on it, um, but today we'll primarily focus on our survey findings. We are primarily focused on the school level today, coherence among these seven key components. And we also explore the idea that certain contextual conditions help drive or support the development of coherence. And you see these five components that we explore here. So then in a nutshell, this figure that you see right now summarizes our conceptualization of coherent instructional system and uh, captures what we are studying. Uh, I've already alluded to our methods of investigation. Uh, essentially, we developed a survey that asked, among other questions, which of the seven instructional system components teachers perceive to get information or guidance from about what and how to teach. And then we asked them about the presence or the strength of the relationship that they perceive among these components. And as Julia mentioned, we administered our survey via the American Educator Panel in spring 2021 and again in spring 2022 to K to 12 ELA and math teachers. And we also administered a parallel survey to school administrators or leaders. The AEPs are a nationally representative sample of teachers and school leaders across the country. And these panelists are invited to take periodic surveys on important education related topics. I wanted to say that we did administer the survey to math and ELA teachers, uh, but our analyses actually indicate that the results for both of these subjects are very similar. So for simplicity today, we focus on the 2022 math findings, and these are based on the responses of 818 math teachers across the country, but I will bring in some ELA findings in places for some contrast. In addition to a national sample, we also fielded the same survey to state representative samples of ELA teachers in two partner states, uh, Rhode Island and Tennessee. Um, I also alluded to qualitative data. So we did conduct semi-structured interviews with uh, about 45 K-12 math and ELA teachers from the panel. We also interviewed state officials in our two partner states and conducted some interviews with district and school leaders and teachers in some of the case study uh, districts and schools. And these have provided some interesting insights beyond the survey data. And we include um, some of these findings in the presentation as well today. On the whole, our data collection was in service of answering several research questions. And really there are three sets or three buckets of questions. One set is about what information are teachers getting from the seven instructional system components about what and how to teach. Then we ask about more squarely about coherence. What are the relationships that teachers perceive about the information they're getting from these different components? And then how is this concept or a measure of coherence associated with school context and with instructional practices? Um, I'll get on with some findings and then we'll break in a little bit with some expert commentary after this set of findings. So we first wanted to know just what information at all um, are teachers perceiving from different instructional components? And we found that First of all, for three of the instructional system components highlighted in yellow here, between 25 and 40% of math teachers indicated they were just not receiving guidance from that component to support their instruction, or the component was not present in their school system. I do wanna point out, of course, that the survey was fielded in spring 2022, when schools were still monitoring, mitigating against COVID-19, um, although much less so than in the two prior years. So key instructional system components that might have been interrupted 
two years prior, namely the state assessments and teacher evaluation processes. Those were largely reinstated at the state level and at the national level by the time we have surveyed. And so given this, it is uh, concerning that teachers perceive little guidance from these three important system components. We asked teachers whether they received information and guidance from the topic, uh, from the components on five topics. And those are the five column headings that you see. Um, just a snapshot across topics, the majority of math teachers indicated receiving guidance from their curriculum and from the component that we call teacher collaboration. And then across components, we see that near majorities of teachers reported receiving guidance on the content to emphasize and the rigor or the level of difficulty of what students are expected to do for math. And results are similar for ELA. But the components appear to provide little guidance about how to address equity and diversity in instruction. So you see that an average of 21% only of math teachers indicated that components provide any such guidance. The potential bright spot is that formal PD and teacher collaboration seem to be the components from which teachers perceive some guidance on this important topic. And here you might expect that ELA teachers perceive more guidance. Uh, and I would say yes, but not considerably so. On average across components, compared to the 21 you see here, only 26% of ELA teachers perceive guidance on addressing equity and diversity in their instruction. Guidance provided by curriculum does account for the main difference with about 15% more ELA than math teachers saying that curriculum provides guidance on equity and diversity and how to address in the classroom. So 34% instead of the 19 that you see here. So we look more closely at the question of how instructional system components support teachers to teach to priority students and found that the majority of math and ELA teachers indicated that the guidance from at least one instructional system component provided, quote, a lot of support to address the needs of students in general. And that's the tall blue bar. But when we asked if they're receiving a lot of support to address the needs of traditionally underserved students, you can see the bar uh, you know, decreases, the proportion decreases significantly. Much less so for English learners, that's the green bar, students with disabilities, the purple bar, and students of color. And keep in mind that this figure depicts the percentage of teachers indicating that even one of the seven instructional system components provides them with a lot of support. So we suspect that the percentage of teachers in systems in which multiple components are conveying coordinated, similar supportive messages to teachers about how to serve these students is actually much, much smaller. Um, and I'll quickly spotlight some qualitative data that uh, reinforce that, con that conception or those findings. One theme is just what I said, teachers perceive little or no explicit messaging about teaching for equity or diversity or addressing students' needs through various system components. Even though PD was a bit of a spotlight, when teachers share that they're often told the strategies they learn in PD can also apply to English language learners, but such learners are never the focus of the PD that they receive. A second theme is that teachers perceive the tension between messages telling them to implement the curriculum with fidelity and the idea that they should scaffold or support students' particular needs. Um, before I leave this section, I just want to bring in a little bit of investigation of our focal state. So this is state level insights. Uh, we surveyed state representative samples of ELA teachers in two states, and here's how their results compared to the national average. Cells are shaded yellow if the proportion of teachers indicating that they receive guidance from that component is significantly lower than the national average. And on the other hand, cells are shaded green if the proportion is significantly higher than the national average. And we found some correspondence between teacher survey results and state policies. So for example, states and, uh, teachers in state one perceive little guidance around addressing equity in a classroom and when we interviewed state officials, we heard they were in the process of conceptualizing and implementing supports around this topic. So they had not yet released, uh, sorry, they were recently, um, they had very recently released some documents and frameworks and that had not made its way to schools yet. 
And then in state two, we see that teachers perceive strong messaging uh, via the teacher evaluation system compared to the rest of the nation. And in fact, the state had created content specific materials to guide the walkthroughs that are used to monitor instruction and provide teachers feedback. And so in short, the takeaway is that we're starting to see, we are seeing signals that state policies and context do relate to and likely influence teachers' perceptions of the messaging around what and how to teach. And I'll return to this, this idea of uh, the potential role of state policies a little bit later. Um, but right now, I'd really like to get Emily Hodge to provide some commentary analysis on this set of findings, perhaps especially related to findings around uh, equity and diversity and supports for traditionally underserved students. All right, thank you so much for including me today to discuss some of these fascinating findings. This study gives us insight into many different angles of teachers' perceptions around when their school environments feel coherent. And coherence is about how policies feel to teachers, how teachers experience reform and policy change. Coherence is different than alignment. Educational leaders at state and district levels can design aligned systems where these different instructional systems components, curriculum, standards, et cetera, might seem very complementary on paper, but they can feel like a jumbled and contradictory mess to teachers, which then defeats the whole purpose. So these first two research questions that the study asked looked at the extent to which these instructional system components send messages to teachers about things like content to emphasize, instructional strategies, pacing, rigor, and addressing equity and diversity, as well as going more deeply into the ways in which teachers did or didn't feel supported in meeting the needs of student groups who are often underserved, English learners, students with disabilities, and students of color. So in terms of guidance about instruction from these different components, some of these findings are as you might expect. Not a ton of teachers found their summative assessments to provide them with meaningful guidance about instruction, which always makes sense given the timing of those assessments towards the end of the school year. However, it was striking to me that over a third of teachers did not feel that either their evaluations or professional development related to their instruction. And that to me signaled untapped potential for creating the conditions that would help teachers feel that they were working in a more coherent instructional system. Teachers are, however, receiving guidance from their curriculum materials, at least about some things. So over half to almost two thirds of math teachers and similar proportions for ELA thought that their curriculum materials provided them with information about content, instruction, pacing, and even rigor, but not overall how to address equity and diversity. Only 19% of math teachers and 34% of ELA teachers thought that their curriculum materials gave them information about how to teach with equity and diversity in mind. And the survey also found that less than half of teachers are getting a lot of instructional guidance from any of these components at all, not just curriculum, about how to teach English learners, students with disabilities, or students of color. And so while messages about how to teach English learners, for example, might they might not need to come from all instructional system components, but this is definitely an area where curriculum, professional development, and also school leaders can do better, I think, in terms of the norms they set for teachers' collaboration and professional learning. Now, in this survey, messages about equity and diversity were not defined for teachers, but teacher interviews suggested at least three different ideas. One was uh, scaffolding and curriculum adaptations. The second was culturally responsive instructional approaches. And the third was content that includes broader cultural representation. And certainly this could also include content that explicitly addresses issues of race, gender, and other forms of inequality. To me, curriculum that better supports teachers in those three aspects of teaching with equity and diversity in mind is a major missed opportunity in the conversation around high quality instructional materials. Curriculum materials certainly can be designed to include diverse text in English language arts, for example, but materials should also provide guidance for teachers on how to adapt these materials in ways that are consistent with the materials underlying intent and in ways that will increase scaffolding 
but also maintain the overall level of cognitive demand and rigor. Teachers are always going to try to adapt materials in an effort to meet their perception of what students' needs are. And I think that creating, curating, and adapting curriculum materials are critical skills for all teachers to have. No curriculum works for everyone, but those adaptations can often reduce rigor or at times move away from the underlying goals when teachers don't have a strong sense of what those underlying goals are. So I argue that curriculum materials can and should be, ed can and should be educative, meaning that they provide learning opportunities for teachers so that teachers can use and adapt them in ways that are in line with the broader goals of the curriculum, but also with what I've called a logic of differentiation in some of my work. So this means that curriculum adaptations and guidance about appropriate curriculum adaptations are coming from a place where teachers believe and talk about students' abilities as mutable or able to be changed, where teachers view students as individuals with a whole range of readiness levels and strengths in different domains, and teachers see themselves as having responsibility for student learning rather than blaming students or their identities for students' current level of achievement in a particular area. Curriculum together with professional development and potentially teachers collaborative learning time and some of these other instructional system components have an important role to play in being complementary and mutually reinforcing to each other, making sure that teachers have these types of beliefs consistent with the logic of differentiation and that their curriculum adaptations will productively support students. So as we move on to discuss how teachers can experience either reinforcing or contradictory signals from these multiple system components, um, let's, keep, let's continue to keep in mind how these components can work together to support teaching with equity and diversity in mind. So I'll turn it back to Elaine here to continue with the findings. Okay, let's get more squarely into coherence. We just talked about information guidance teachers are getting from various components. In part two, we'll get a little bit at the uh, extent of reinforcement. Um, among and between components. So we ask teachers to rate how similar the messages are that they're getting from each possible pair of components. And given our seven components, there's a total possibility of 21 of these pairs. Uh, ratings of one and two for us meant that teachers perceive the component pair as sending dissimilar or conflicting messages. And we interpret that as kind of incoherence between those component pairs. Meanwhile, ratings of three and four mean that teachers are perceiving the component pair as sending similar or reinforcing messages. And the summary table shows that on the whole, teachers are uh, per perceiving um, each of these pairs as some at least somewhat reinforcing. So they're blue, they're not colored deep red. However, there are some differences. Uh, tab the table shows that teachers perceive certain components as most reinforcing of others. That's the darkest blue cells. Specifically, standards, curriculum are perceived as very strongly reinforcing of each other and other components like PD. What's interesting to note is that teachers perceive the teacher collaboration component as a very reinforcing of all other components. So if you look across that row and also down that row, you'll see that there's dark blue colors with every component pair for teacher collaboration with the exception of summative assessment, which is um, uh, the least reinforcing with any other component. So we can depict each teacher's perception of their instructional system visually. You can imagine that a teacher perceiving, uh, you can imagine a teacher perceiving standards as sending similar messages as all other six components. You can imagine that somebody perceives teacher evaluation as sending dissimilar messages about what and how to teach as all other components. Basically, you can imagine many uh, possible configurations. So uh, we took this a little bit further. This might strike you as very similar to the depiction of sociograms and network analysis. So we took inspiration from that to conceptualize a network of seven instructional components. And we ended up calculating what we call network density as our measure of instructional system coherence. Basically, it just describes the ratio of observed possible ties meaning two components providing similar reinforcing messages, 
to the total possible ties, which like I said, is 21 because we have seven components. So this network density value um, has to be between zero and one. And the closer it is to one, the more coherent a system it is. That's our interpretation. And we found that on average, about 13 out of 21 possible ties are present and positive uh, as perceived by all of our teachers. So then the density value is 0.61, which we interpret as moderately coherent. We should point out that teachers in our system kind of run the gamut with um, a proportion of teachers perceiving at least that their system is wholly coherent, meaning all 21 ties are, are green. But we also had teachers uh, perceiving different combinations of green and red ties. I'll just quickly give you an example of, a, of system coherence. So uh, a real example. In our case study work, um, there is a school district and this district recently adopted a standards aligned instructional material, and they regard it as a foundation, an important foundation upon which to build coherence. The district in the school provides teachers with directions on how to use the material and helps to keep teachers accountable to that. So for example, the district hired a curriculum integration specialists and interventionists to help implement the materials, including for the priority student groups. And teachers also receive PD training from the vendor on how to use that material. So the PD is aligned to the curriculum that's been adopted. And there are content and grade level meetings in which teachers are expected to discuss how to approach curriculum implementation, use the PD, they learn from the vendors to integrate curriculum, et cetera. So pretty coherent. I've just described the green ties or the green lines on this diagram. But on the other hand, teachers in this school, in this district, are asked to use a variety of assessments and diagnostic tools to monitor student progress. And those teachers perceive are not key to the curriculum they adopted, uh, not in scope, not in sequence, not in the rigor of the content. So teachers said that the assessments provide no guidance around how to support priority students. The teacher evaluation criteria also do not attune to what is emphasized in the curriculum and the PD they receive. Uh, in fact, teachers describe that as ineffective and, quote, watered down, and those depict the red ties. So you can imagine that um, teachers are teaching in these schools, and it's what I've described as not atypical. Um, quickly, earlier I mentioned that we saw signals that state policies appear to influence teachers' perceptions of the guidance they get from various system components. Here I just want to highlight that states can facilitate system coherence for districts and schools. In fact, in our case study of two states, we noted that state agencies enacted a few similar strategies. Primarily, they focused on supporting schools to adopt standards-aligned materials, often even incentivizing that. They developed and communicated a shared vision of what and how teachers should teach, for example, through ELA curriculum frameworks that connect to other state frameworks. Uh, in Rhode Island, the Department of Education developed professional learning groups that assist educators in collaborating and implementing the curriculum. And they also facilitated regular meetings between state level curriculum directors and assistant superintendents in districts. Uh, in the other states, state officials in Tennessee talked about breaking down silos across the departments or offices so that all employees, whether they're in the Office or Department of Special Education or assessments or professional learning, everybody's on the same page about the state's messages and priorities. In, in other words, they're working to ensure system coherence at the state level, thinking that would support district and school level coherence. And at this point, we might wonder how does perceived, co how do teachers perceive coherence and coherence and how does that impact teachers? So think about that example school um, I just described. How would teachers there feel? So in interviews, we learned that teachers said system coherence increases their confidence with their work and, one teach and it helps them to feel successful. One teacher said, quote, uh, reinforcing messages help you to be confident in your instruction. If you're secure in what kids need to know and be able to do, you can feel a little bit more flexible and creative in how you approach instruction. And on the flip side, teachers stated that incoherence increases their frustration. It makes them feel overwhelmed, confused, and discouraged. 
Uh, misalignment in messages can also contribute to a lack of trust between administrators and teachers. We had one teacher tell us that, quote, maybe the administration is trying to make us fail. We also heard in interviews what teachers do when they try to navigate incoherence. One main strategy is to lean into peer collaboration. And we've heard that come up a few times. One teacher that's operating with a curriculum supposedly not aligned to standards and not supported by District PD said that they think peer-to-peer -peer professional learning opportunities help them make sense of what they ought to do. Um, we learn so much from each other, she said. And hearing from other teachers say, here's what I did with the standards, here's how I you know, used it to guide my curriculum instruction matters more than having someone else say, here's how to use this curriculum. A second strategy I'll highlight is teachers perceive that incoherence or mixed messaging, um, when they perceive it, they anchor to the standards. So one teacher said, understanding and teaching the standards helps to provide a framework to understand where your lesson should be headed and what direction you're teaching toward. And the last one I want to highlight is to navigate incoherence teachers. We also did hear teachers say that they mentally check out. They push through and they hope for the best or they simply ignore messaging. So we had one teacher describe that their interim assessment and standards don't match and the curriculum uh, doesn't really match the standards that students would be tested on. So to navigate this, the teachers simply ignored the messaging saying, I'm not a vocal, oh, this doesn't make sense. Why are we doing this kind of person? I just say, okay. And then I go and do what I think is best. Um, so that was kind of our highlights of findings around coherence and teachers' perceptions. I'd love to bring in an expert at this point, Thomas Hatch, who has thought deeply about instructional system coherence um, to get your take, Tom, to react to and expand beyond these findings. Thank, thanks, Elaine, and uh, thanks to you and Julia and all your colleagues for what I think is a really uh, interesting uh, set of findings that really help us to unpack some of the complexities around uh, coherence. And I'll just make a couple of general comments, picking up on uh, some issues that, that Emily raised in the first commentary, uh, and then also try and get into uh, some, some specific questions related to this, you know, managing coherence and incoherence, which I think is also connected to a question in the Q&A. Um, about whether or not you disaggregated your data and whether or not we have a sense of which teachers might have felt a um, greater sense of coherence. And, you know, I can turn it back to you to address that um, at the end. But, but first, I think it's really worth, um, you know, noting that we really haven't had much of a conversation about coherence um, until it was certainly the 1990s and systemic reform efforts that brought alignment to the forefront. Um, but I think the issues and challenges with aligning different parts of the system um, help people to recognize that uh, alignment in and of itself um, is not necessarily the driver of the kind of instructional improvement that systemic reform was, was hoping for. Um, and it was some you know, work uh, that Meredith Honig and I did talking about crafting coherence and what it takes to do that. That, that really tried to emphasize this point that, that Emily raised, that alignment and coherence are not the same thing. That you can have a system with components that are aligned or where messages are, are aligned, but where people still perceive it as a, incoherent. And, a, and there's several critical aspects to that. One is there just may be so many different components that you're trying to align that and so little time in which to you know, act on this alignment and to put into practice all the things you're being told that you can feel overwhelmed and you feel like the work is fragmented and that can undermine any sense of coherence. Um, so I think that's really critical. Um, but another thing that I think your study really helps us to unpack is that you can feel that a system is coherent in some ways and not in others. So, you know, while I think it's really interesting the way you come up with that density, you know, that maybe 0.61, uh, there's a sense of coherence of, you know, 61% or something. Um, I actually think it's those, um, the red lines and the green lines that really give us uh, some food for thought and help us to think about, um, 
you know, go beyond thinking about average coherence in a sense to think about uh, how our sense of alignment and coherence of different parts of the system uh, may either support us in doing our work or undermine it. Um, so for example, um, it could be that you feel a lot of sense of coherence among a number of elements, but if the summative assessments are not aligned and you don't feel that, um, that there's a consistency and a coherence between the tests and the curriculum, that that could undermine any overall sense of coherence um, that you have. Uh, another critical factor, which I think is interesting, I mean, you do point out that for the most part, your English and math teachers, you know, both felt kind of the same about coherence. But if you're a school leader or a set of teachers, um, it, it really doesn't matter what kind of the overall sense of coherence in the district or the um, or the state is, what matters is the sense in which you and your colleagues share a common sense of coherence. So um, it's important if both the math teachers and English teachers and the science teachers and special ed teachers all feel that sense of coherence. Um, uh, but it's, it's possible that you could have a majority of teachers who are feeling a sense of coherence. Maybe it's the veteran teachers as the question in the Q&A implied um, there could be pockets of new teachers, or maybe it is the special ed teachers or the teachers of um, students with disabilities or of immigrant students that aren't feeling that sense of coherence. Understanding that, you know, can, can help a leader and teachers to address those issues, um, but uh, it, it, it requires really getting beyond that, that general sense um, of coherence. And then, you know, I would also um, just illustrate or, or highlight the way that you said that, you know, the state can do things to try and create an aligned system to try and support coherence. The more aligned it is, um, the, the system is, it can support coherence. If the system is not trying to ask teachers to do much, too much in too little time, that can also help to create a, a, a situation in which teachers can feel a sense of coherence but also at the um, school level, uh, there's a lot that education leaders can do for helping teachers to navigate and make sense of or build on a coherent and aligned policy context or to try to um, uh, deal with the incoherence that might come from that uh, policy level. And, um, and those uh, strategies from the education leaders can include you know, what Meredith Honig and I talked about is bridging and buffering. And that relates to some of the strategies that you highlighted with the teachers. So just as the teachers might, in a sense, buffer themselves from this incoherent environment by shutting it out, closing their door and focusing on what they wanna do, um, a school leader can also help to signal to the teachers and to the staff um, what kinds of curriculum uh, to pay attention to, which aspects of the system and the state guidance to pay attention to and to connect to, um, and which to ignore. So in a sense, the, the leader is both making connections to uh, strategies, resources, and policies that can help build the coherence of the staff, while um, also trying to buffer the staff from those other kinds of issues. And, and I just wanna stress that um, ultimately, it may, a lot of it may come down to the sense of agency and confidence and trust that teachers and leaders either feel in themselves or their colleagues or their school or their district, um, because that's what's going to enable them to try and uh, not only navigate the incoherence, but really um, take advantage of and build on the coherence in the state policies and guidance that can help them move towards their school and organizational goals. Our next set of questions, research questions, and Julia was just saying that we did not find um, much variation. Oh, I should also say we didn't find much variation or we found small variations with teacher reported kind of classroom level student demographics, although that's tenuous. But where we did find strong association was when we um, uh, kind of correlated or, or sorry, um, looked at the association between our measure of density and these hypothesized drivers or conditions of coherence. And all the coefficients are positive and significant. Um, and so this gives us confidence 
that our measure of coherence is kind of picking up on what it's intended to do. And it is um, giving signals that perhaps we're not sure about causality or direction, but certainly if you were um, looking to develop school culture or looking to develop school leadership, um, some of these, what we envision as precursors or drivers of coherence, um, it would be, do you well to focus on some of these. Our very last kind of research question is around association between, again, our measure of coherence, that density measure, and standards aligned instructional practices. Again, the hypothesis is that, you know, teachers reporting teaching in more coherent schools would probably use standards aligned instruction more frequently or with more fidelity. Um, and let's in, in our study, we did not find an association between reported instructional system coherence and standards aligned curriculum material use. We did find that math teachers who reported teaching in more coherent systems were less likely to report making modifications or adaptations to their materials for the majority of the time. Doesn't mean they didn't do so, they just didn't do it perhaps with as much frequency um, or as many lessons as others. Um, the associations were similar for ELA with slightly larger negative coefficients. And then we also investigated the relationship between, again, our measure of coherence and a set of standards aligned practices that we've asked consistently about in other ATP surveys. And again, our hypothesis was that in more standards aligned coherence systems, teachers would be getting clearer messages about the kinds of instructional learning practices they and their students should engage in. For math, we found that teachers reporting teaching in a more coherent system were not more likely to report regular use of any of these standards aligned practices we asked about. For ELA, we found some tenuous relationships with a few of the standards aligned practices we asked about. But I should say that in summary, we think the lack of definitive results in this exploration of relationship between perceived coherence and instruction is due to probably several reasons, including the persistent challenge that we've experienced in trying to measure instruction, particularly with a one-time survey. Um, so we suspect that perhaps with more sensitive measures on instruction, we might um, see some relationships. So um, uh, now I'd like to turn it over for some culminating comments and perhaps some grand implications or some considerations anyhow about what all this might mean for researchers and for state level and other policymakers. So um, I invite Tom to speak first. Great, um, thanks, thanks again, Elaine. Uh, and I think you, you just raised a, a number of really interesting questions. And to me, um, you, you know, they really uh, highlight the contribution that this research can make around helping us develop our theory of action of how alignment and coherence might make a difference in terms of improvement. But I do think it's worth um, noting that I think there is a kind of default assumption on the part of many policymakers that if we create more aligned uh, systems, uh, particularly aligned to standards uh, with um, stronger instructional materials and uh, educators feel a sense of coherence, um, then uh, instruction will be standards aligned and we will see improvements in student learning. Uh, and we have a long way to go to really um, seeing whether and how that theory of action plays out. But I think your work is a really important part of investigating some of these uh, critical aspects of that theory of action. So uh, what I hope you know, your study does and this conversation does today is really help people uh, raise some questions about how coherence and alignment might operate and how we as teachers, as educators, as school leaders, as policymakers and researchers um, can begin to think about um, how to uh, develop strategies for pursuing alignment and coherence that, that might be productive. Um, I, I, I think it's, I, I've done some work in uh, Finland. Uh, I just got back from a trip to Finland and Estonia. I know a lot of people don't wanna hear about it, 
Finland anymore, particularly since their PISA scores are going down. But I do like to point out to people that their scores are going down like this and ours are still down here. So we've, uh, we've got a long way to, to catch up. Um, but, but one of the things that's striking about the Finnish system is you, you can say it's, it's pretty well aligned. Um, but I would also argue that it's, uh, there, there's a quite coherent sense, not just amongst educators, uh, but amongst policymakers, researchers, parents, and the general public, um, that it's a coherent system and that people understand what the underlying values and goals are. Um, and it's that general sense of coherence that provides the trust in, and supports the trust in teachers and the trust in schools, that things are going in a good direction. It basically just establishes a kind of climate um, that uh, makes, builds confidence in people that I think is, is really uh, important and powerful. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily provide a lot of detailed guidance about exactly what to do in the classroom. And in fact, as we know, um, there, you know, teachers in Finland are well known for their, for their autonomy. And you may not see the same kinds of instructional practices in one classroom that you would see uh, or even textbooks used as um, next door. So there is a, a difficult balancing act uh, between kind of uh, coming together around priorities and goals and how deep and detailed to go. Because um, the more detailed the guidance is, the harder it is to be aligned and the more complex it is, uh, which can make it difficult um, to support and sustain that coherence. So there's a, an interesting balance between that sense of coherence and the complexity uh, of the system, uh, particularly in arenas uh, like working with uh, immigrant students or students um, uh, with special, uh, with disabilities, uh, where uh, you know, teachers really need, may need some specialized expertise and support. There's a lot more to talk about, but maybe I'll stop there for the for the time being. Um, Emily, do you want to pick up on some other issues? Uh, sure. Thanks, Tom. All right. So on my end, thinking about these findings as a whole, now that we most recently heard about the conditions that support coherence um, in both the presentation and in Tom's comments, I'd like to make two points. The first is about the complex ecosystem of the curriculum marketplace right now and the, some of the pros and cons of different places that teachers find materials. And the second is about the conditions that facilitate teachers' perceptions of coherence. So on the first point about the complex ecosystem of today's curriculum marketplace, we know that curriculum can serve as an important form of instructional guidance, even more so when it's created to be educative for teachers. So where do these materials come from and what are some of the benefits and drawbacks of different sources? Materials obviously can come from publishers and organizations writing year-long curricula. Ed reports can generally rate these materials and provide an external signal of quality. But materials can also be assembled by teams of teachers, as in some of the amazing districts that use teacher teams to curate open educational resources into units and also into year-long curricula. These materials can't be rated by ed reports, but they also seem to have other benefits. Teachers describe creating these open source curriculum for their local context as deeply professionalizing. And then of course, there's also more piecemeal resources coming from professional organizations for math and ELA, from state departments of education and from lots of other online sources. Yes, including Teachers Pay Teachers. And although there can be issues with inconsistent quality and sometimes problematic messages about equity and diversity in the case of Teachers Pay Teachers resources, there's also tons of great materials available for teachers to use. In some cases, materials that may be better for some students than materials that might be highly rated on ed reports. This study found that when teachers worked in more coherent systems. They modified the curriculum less often. But as I mentioned before, modifications can be quite important when they operate in service of broader learning goals and are done with a logic of differentiation. No curriculum is going to be culturally responsive for everyone. 
No curriculum is going to provide perfect guidance for teaching all English learners. So teachers are going to adapt materials and select additional resources. So my goal would be for them to know how to do this in ways that will meet students' individual needs and be rooted in asset-based beliefs about students' capabilities and their potential. This study also suggested that states might continue to incentivize the adoption of high quality materials. And there are states in the CCSSO sponsored network for the use of high quality materials that are doing just this. One downside of this strategy, however, is that then states are working against norms of local control and also the norm of education as a profession, which can indicate internal control. So states that are incentivizing materials have come up with some different rhetorical strategies and financial incentives to make those materials seem attractive to districts, but teachers are existing in an ecosystem where they learn from each other, both within schools and formal educator preparation programs, alternate route programs, professional conferences, Twitter, TikTok. And I would say that this is actually a feature and not a bug. People learn together. So I think that teachers should be encouraged to use their professional development and professional learning time to co-construct better ways of adapting their curriculum to meet the needs of their students. Um, and then just a few final uh, points on how does one create a coherent system of instructional guidance, picking up on a few of Tom's points. Um, a few items to have on your to-do list and your not to-do list. So certainly the items that the study authors found um, that support coherence, having a vision, culture of continuous improvement, time and resources, those are on the to-do list, especially around teacher collaboration. And some of my prior work with Elizabeth Stosich, we looked at the implementation of the Common Core and related policies in two large districts. And this offered a few additional uh, guidelines to think about, including the sequence of how policies are put into place and the, pa the pace of change. When policies change too quickly or there's too many policies that change, it can lead to policy overwhelm, regardless of whether or not the guidance from these components might technically seem mutually reinforcing. Same with putting in a high stakes summative assessment too soon. So where to start? Reducing or eliminating conflicting messages is a fantastic place to begin. Then I would focus on what's under the control of school leaders. Standards and state summative assessments are probably not. I would focus on professional development and teacher collaboration related to curriculum adaptation as the single most important place to begin based on these findings. I think the social benefits of strong relationships between adults and schools are good for trust, collaboration, teacher learning, and ultimately for student learning. So thanks again for the chance to discuss this important work. And it'll be great if we have the time to hear a few more questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we, uh, we just have a few more minutes. And so I did wanna just address really quickly one of the questions that was raised um, about portraits of a graduate. So I don't know as much about portraits of a graduate as other people, but it feels like a really useful tool to help build coherence. I, I understand it's a process where the education system and the community kind of create a collective vision of what a graduate should look like. And I think that's that's a great tool for building coherence potentially. I don't know if Tom or Emily wanted to say anything else about that. Well, my local school district uh, where my daughter just graduated last year uh, was using that as an, as an exercise. And I think um, building on what you just said, it can be a potentially powerful means of developing a sense of coherence but uh, to me, the larger point is we need activities like that, that bring together stakeholders uh, from inside and outside schools. So whether it's teachers or teachers and administrators or teachers, administrators and parents and community members and policymakers and others, um, we need to have those kinds of activities on a regular basis where people can talk about the values and goals of the system. And as you said, the portrait of a graduate is one example that gets people thinking about their common goals. Um, and so that can be a powerful way to um, help people develop a shared understanding. But from my perspective, that's what's really 
important. It's not coherence per se. It's the extent to which people have a shared understanding and have opportunities to continue to discuss and develop that shared understanding um, over time. That's that's a great answer. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I, and to that point, uh, I just wanted to mention that um, we have created a toolkit that is actually intended to help districts reflect more on coherence. So that's another tool that you could add to your toolkit if if you are interested as a district or a school in pursuing coherence. Um, Elaine just posted that um, website where we have all our reports, and I also shared it with you in the chat. Um, so please explore those resources and reach out to us if you have questions. We're always happy to answer your questions um, via email, um, chat with you about these uh, concepts and these ideas. But we are so appreciative of Tom and Emily for taking the time today to speak. Um, we will we are recording this and we will post this webinar on our website as another another um piece of uh, the, another artifact to help you think about coherence more. We'll post it on our website. Um, but I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today.